Glory to God. Hey, Ben. Well, today is a great day. It's always a great day when we get to dedicate a newborn child to the Lord. Hey, Ben. So exciting. And uh, so this morning, we have a special time uh, of being able for just a dear family. And uh, so we're excited uh, for all of this because uh, these folks have just recently moved out to join us. We're excited about that. Austin and Sarah this morning. So uh, Stephen and Connie's daughter and, and son-in-law and their brand new grandson. Woohoo! So, so exciting. Amen. So uh, this morning, we're going to ask Otto to make his way up here and bring his parents with him. Awesome. So good. So awesome. Amen. Come on up here, guys. Amen. God is so good. That's no fair, man. That dude's got more hair than I ever had. Look at that. That's awesome. How beautiful. And great grandma crocheted this for him. That is awesome. Look at you. Wow. So awesome. Look at that. That is cool. Can I have that when you're done? No. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you ask, you have not, because you ask not. Amen. I'm just checking. <laughs> Amen. Well, praise the Lord. This is such a special time, honey. Oh, my wife's in the in the other room. That's all right. Praise God. Amen. Um. So Austin and Sarah, today you've made an amazing choice. You've come here today to dedicate your son, Otto Stephen Solomon, to the Lord. You're following in the footsteps of godly men and women who have gone before you in this very same manner, recognizing that the every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father, especially our children. Amen. And just like Joseph and Mary did with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you're bringing your son to dedicate him to the Lord today. You know, here at our church, there's a lot of different views on how we dedicate children to the Lord. Some people baptize children, they sprinkle children. But we understand that little Otto is in this place of innocence right now. And so he hasn't committed any sins yet. Pretty soon you're going to find out he has a will. And you have the responsibility of training and helping him and learning how to have a submitted will to authority and to the Father. But there's nothing that we can baptize him for. So what we do here is we dedicate our children to the Lord. Not only them, but we dedicate our lives to the Lord and how we serve him for their benefit. In Luke 22, it says, They brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Otto, do you have those with you today? Huh? Do you? No? Okay. All righty. Dad will get those for you later and we'll barbecue. There you go. So you're recognizing the gift of life that God has given you and the responsibility that is yours to raise your son Otto to know as God so that he might grow up to become the man of God that he's already been ordained to be, living to fulfill God's purpose in his life according to Ephesians 2.10, which says this, We are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. So guys, God already has a life planned for your son, a great life, purpose for his life, and you get to raise him up to fulfill that. Psalms 127 says this, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has this quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies. So you've begun to fill your quiver. This is exciting. Amen. So Austin and Sarah, not only are you presenting Otto to the Lord today, 
but in doing so, you're making the commitment before God and this company to maintain a Christian home in which Christ is honored and the Word of God is held in reverence, providing and securing a sure foundation in your home to withstand the storms of life. As Christian parents, a responsibility rests to you to set your lives apart unto God so that Otto can clearly see a living example of what it means to give and live his life for Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and to live his life in such a way that is pleasing to God. The responsibility that God entrusts us with as parents includes continually praying for our children, instructing them in the way of the Lord, setting before them that godly example and to encourage, train, and even discipline them, even as the Lord does us. This responsibility can only be fulfilled through Christ's strength, as Paul declared in Philippians 4, when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there's going to be days ahead when you're going to say, Oh, Lord, give me strength. Amen. And the wisdom he graciously provides according to James. God has you covered with all the wisdom you're going to need to raise your son. So as your family and friends, we commit to stand with you, to pray with you, to pledge our support to you in raising your son Otto to live and fulfill God's purpose in his life. So today I charge you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you dedicate young Otto to the Lord, to continue to live your lives in obedience and honor to the Lord so that he may become all that God has ordained him to be, covered by your love and by his grace as he grows up into a mighty man of God. Would you join us as we pray today? Heavenly Father, we just lay our hands on young Otto. And Lord, we lay our hands on mom and dad today. We thank you, Father. God, that your grace is always more than enough for what we need. And Father, we dedicate this young man to you this morning. We thank you. As we've read in your word, you have already prepared your purpose and plan for his life. You've already prearranged everything that you've set for him to accomplish so father we thank you you're going to anoint mom and dad with the wisdom the strength the courage and the fortitude that they need to be the parents that Otto needs so that he can fulfill your destiny in his life so we just declare your anointing upon them your wisdom working through them and your grace strengthening them for every season and every situation as great parents, Father. So we bless them today and we dedicate young Otto to you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Praise the Lord. You're blessed, guys. Amen. What a beautiful baby. Okay. Okay, here's a a special certificate for you. And now tonight, the best way to have him start reading the New Testament is to to start him in the book of John, okay? (laughs) And then, so have him read the first three chapters to you tonight, and it'll be awesome. Amen? Bless you guys. He's not far from us. Amen. Bless you guys. Amen. Oh, excuse me, Grandma. God bless you. Amen. God is so good. Amen? Thanks, Hallelujah. Bless you guys. Thank you. Amen. Bless you, Connie. Amen. Love you. Amen. God's good. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, guys, let's pause because we have a bunch of stuff. I thank you. We have three other things to do this morning, and we'll uh, jump into the altar this morning. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God is good. Praise God. Amen. And, uh, oh, no, you're all right. My bad. Amen. Yeah, um, let me uh, just give you a Cool. Thank you, guys. Amen. There you go. I called an audible. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me just say this just before we transition. We have uh, a couple of things to do, the special things to do this morning. And uh, we're going to be hearing from our Mexico team. We had a group went down to Mexico and uh, built three houses for uh, some women down there in the recovery center. So that's super exciting. And so we want to hear about that. 
And, uh, but also, I just want to say, if you'd like to be involved in people when it comes to our prayer, uh, we have a team that meets here every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. up in our conference room for pre-service prayer. So if you'd like to be a part of that, that that's another way to be involved, praying for our service and, and uh, preparation in that. Also, a reminder, our new devotionals are out there, the word for the day, so grab one of those. And uh, on your way out for November, for December, January, and February. And uh, then this Wednesday, Ray and Jenny are heading down to be a family, and so there won't be a prayer service this, this Wednesday here, but uh, coming up, so that's a part of that. And then I want to say, again, thank you for your donation to the shoe boxes, and then everybody that's been helping around here. If you notice, we have a whole team of, of men and women that are helping uh, on the landscaping, so we have uh, just cleaning things up all around the place, the parking lot, everything. So thank you, everybody, for all of your hard work. Would you give them a hand? I mean, they're working super hard, so we appreciate it. And uh, it, is, it is just such a blessing. And everybody that's been helping on the building and uh, uh, my, uh, my sidekick, Troy, and Nick, uh, Daniel, where's <laughs> Nick at time? He's there. So we love it. Amen. But just a blessing uh, for everything that's going on. Praise God. And uh, so this morning, I'm going to have Pastor Tim come up, and he's going to uh, just walk us through the, uh, the, the missions team and everything that went on. And how many are thankful that God uses us to reach out to our world? World. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. And in doing that uh, right now, and we're blessed as a church right now between what we're donating here and being involved in the Lord's Gym and around the world, right now we're over $100,000 our church has invested into missions this year. Yeah. That's, awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Amen. Yeah. For our church, so we love that, and outreach, and getting the gospel out, and ministering, and that's all because of your faithfulness, and your giving, and making ministry possible. So Pastor Tim, go ahead, and then yeah. we'll go with the other Yeah, segment. and then whenever possible, we want to encourage um, our membership to, to hey, man, join a team, get, get involved, plug in, uh, and head, head off on a mission trip. Been a little bit challenging in this uh, season of COVID to do that, but we had a great opportunity with Jill Mitchell leading a team uh, just uh, two weeks ago. Got back last week, right? So um, we're going to just hear a little bit about that. So I'd like to, um, uh, James, Lori, Perry, are you guys here? If you could come on up here if you're here. Who's, uh, Lori's here, Perry's here. Maybe James, not. Okay, so the two of you, I want to just uh, just ask you guys, come on up, Lori. Oh, and yeah, Dan also was there. And so come on up, Dan. Yeah. Dan also joined the team. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So uh, yeah. So they joined the team with Jill leading the team. Uh, Jill Wave. Yes, Jill. Yeah. You're awesome, Jill. And uh, Jill, just uh, by way of, of uh, if I got this right, um, this was the 98th house or... 98th trip and almost probably 100 around 100 houses that they've that you guys have built over the course of all these trips so amazing yeah so just think of of you know 100 plus families being blessed with a place a roof over their head and a place where they can safely live and be ministered to um, through this whole process. And so I just want to ask you guys, um, first I'll start with you, Perry. What was a highlight of the trip for you? Was this your first trip? It was. It was your first trip. Okay, what was a highlight for you? Seeing the faces of the women who saw God come through. Awesome. That was it. That's so cool. Yeah. And how did they, how did these women, how did, just one example, how did a woman see God come through there? I heard a story um, I think it was Anna who, and, and Nettie kept telling her, God was going to come through. You're going to get your house. You're going to get your house. And as we were handing out the keys and the homes were built, she got her house. That's and true. they encouraged one another to wait on the Lord and to, to watch him work and to be patient. And, and then it happened. And to be part of that, it gives me goosebumps speaking about it. It's awesome. just really a blessing to see these people go through so much yeah. and then God works it all out and people come together somehow and and then we're all there and boom they have a house That's yeah <laughs> That's awesome. That's it. Dan highlight of the trip I think I agree with her you agree Dan agrees with her okay. <laughs> yeah just just a look on their faces and, and they were so excited and happy and 
just bubbling over. It was it was amazing. That's great, Lori. I want to say how um, the body of Christ came together. We had people from Oregon, we had people from Santa Rosa, from Arizona, and the body of Christ came together to build these houses for these women, and they just loved God with all their heart, and you could see that, and they were just so, so it was so honoring to be able to do this for them. How would you, Lori, how would you, if someone's considering, they've never been on a mission trip before like this, and someone would is kind of wanting to step out but have some reservations, what would you say? Would you say? I'd say do it. <laughs> um, I was a little concerned going on this trip. I didn't know Dan or Perry or Jill before I went, and um, but God was telling me to go. And so I stepped out in faith, which is not like me. I'm very shy, and um, it takes me a while to get to know people. But um, God told me to go, and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do when you're building a house? You know, what can I do? And, you know, we're the body of Christ. We're the fingers. We're the toes. No matter what you are, even if you're the pinky toe, we need you because you cause balance. So um, there is something for you to do. And so God will bless you more than you bless them, I'm sure. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, isn't it awesome to see, you know, and part of the growth, part of this growth process is actually being on a team, right? It's just being on a team and being stretched in terms of the relationship dynamics and all that. So there's so much opportunity for growth there. So thank you, Jill, for, uh, for opening up, give, giving us the opportunity to, to, to partner with you in the ministry that you do in Mexico. And um, when's your next trip? Okay. Hopefully soon. And how much money do you need to build one house? $6,000. $6, we can, build a, we can build the next house, guys, so Amen. this is going to be exciting. So keep us posted, okay? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, this morning we have a, uh, in, in the line of missions, and as you know, uh, Pastor Tim and Eve, that's what their heart is. And they've been doing missions. Uh, they've been with us now for three and a half years, almost four years. It, and uh, they've been back in the States four years. This summer was four years you were back in the States. And uh, so they came, and uh, uh, we began to talk, and they... Uh, after they'd been here in January, then we got to talking and Tim came on staff with us in February that following year and has been helping and working with us. And so we're excited for missions. We're excited how God expands and opens doors. But their heart is missions. Their passion is missions. It's outreach and doing everything. So God has opened up some brand new doors. So Eve's going to come up and join. Welcome Eve this morning. She comes up too. Amen. Come on, sis. And... Uh, so we're super excited for what God is doing with them and all of the opportunities. But uh, so uh, we just want you to, to uh, just understand everything that's going on. So they're sharing their heart and what's going on here today. And we're excited for the partnership, the teamwork. Yeah, and uh, I've been teasing Tim. I said, man, you've been a nine-year answer to prayer in my life. <laughs> Amen. Because I'm kind of like a shotgun. I go in all directions all the time. And that, and he kind of focuses in, has a scope and laser, and he keeps me legger fo focused. So he's a tremendous blessing in my life, and I'm excited for all these new opportunities God's Love opened you. up for you guys, man. Love you guys. Amen. Come on. Yeah. So we are excited, and we are excited, but obviously sometimes transitions can feel a bittersweet because um, we experience some degree of loss in transition. So, and that can be a good thing, but it's also challenging. So. This whole area of provision and, and what the, the scripture I shared um, on, in terms of the Israelites crossing the Jordan and the manna stopping and new provision coming, we see this area in our lives as we transition as an area of stepping into a new area of God's provision. And some of the relationships and the resources that we rely on in times of, of stability and in times of consistency uh, don't always stay in the same place, right? And that goes for just about any kinds of transitions we go through. So we're in a place of transition, and we want to just say a little bit more about that. Um, one thing, transitions are opportunities to trust God and to take care of us when relationships and resources we've depended on are no longer part of our lives. It can be hard to do, uh, and, but it's necessary for our growth. 
and which leads us which which leads us to our transition but our story of provision starts with us coming back from overseas after 20 years of living and working overseas coming back to this area having never lived here before except for brief times when we were on furloughs and connecting with Solid Rock Faith Center, coming back to this area, connecting with Pastor Don and Pastor Sue in this body, and then the open invitation and the open door that they gave us to come alongside and to serve with them has been such a tremendous, a tremendous opportunity and blessing. It was, a, it was something we never expected to happen. It was a surprise. We, didn't, we weren't emailing Pastor from Turkey when we were living in Turkey saying, do you have a position for us or whatever, you know, we just, it was a total surprise, but it was God's way of when we were in transition, providing for us in new ways. That's why don't, don't be afraid of transition because it's often opens up a door for new provision. And so this whole season working with pastor and working with you guys and serving alongside so many of you, uh, has been an area of, of just provision that we never dreamed possible, new provision, new ways of seeing God provide and to trust him for that. So, and so this, our transition is going to, Eve is going to kind of lay out what this looks like, but I'll be stepping down from my role as executive pastor here at Solid Rock at the end of the year, but we're still going to be a part of this community. We're not moving. We're not leaving the community. We still live in Camino. We're, that's going to be our base, and Solid Rock will be our home base. So let, Eve will tell you a little bit more about that. Yes, and um, I am actually personally really um, thankful that uh, Pastor Sue said that she still wants me to do Solid Rock Sisters because that's a big um, part of how I plug in here and and busy bees back in the back with the twos and threes and things like that. So Tim and I will still get to serve here because that's our heart and um, be plugged in with you as our church family. Um, Excuse me. The um, the thing that moved us, or one of the main things that moved us from Tajikistan after 16 years there to Turkey, um, and I really kind of feel like we would still be there in Tajikistan if it was up to us, because we loved it there and still love it there. But um, it's something called soul care, which is also known as, it's called pastoral care a lot. Um, Tim and I are both ordained with the Assemblies of God, so we are pastors, but that term pastoral care gets uh, misunderstood sometimes, so I'll explain it just a little bit. But um, from where we usually sit in our pew over there, I can see this wall, the prayer wall really well, and the topics there, the the things that we pray for, the categories. And um, so the Lord just gave me that as an idea to explain to you that pastors and missionaries are dealing with all of those same things, needs in their marriages and their families, healing in their bodies and relationships, salvation for friends and family members, provision, all of that on all those levels. Um, But it kind of feels like it's intensified sometimes in ministry because you live in a fishbowl. So whatever is happening with you and your family in all of those areas is kind of on display for everybody to see. And it also feels like sometimes you don't know where to go for support because, um, yeah, sometimes you, you're just like, okay, you know, the, let's just do this thing. And, and we have a lot of really amazing people in ministry that are strong, full of faith, and they just kind of carry on even through those hard times. But they're, they're really needing extra support through those seasons. And so soul care, again, is what brought us to Turkey to uh, fulfill that or be part of that for missionaries there. Uh, Tim's a life coach and I'm a counselor, so basically resourcing people in those areas. And then as we move back to the States, we've both been doing those things. Of course, Tim was here on staff, so he's doing life coaching part-time. I was counseling full-time. But uh, the district, it's uh, the Assembly of God, Northern California, Nevada district is what it's called. It's 400 churches. It's a network of 400 churches. And uh, Tim and I are gonna serve on a pastoral care team so that when pastors and their families and their ministry teams are needing support, we can help to resource them. So if you don't see us here on a Sunday, it's because we've gone to 
another church somewhere in NorCal where, um, yeah, we might just be a part, like sitting in their service, worshiping with them, taking them out for lunch afterwards or that kind of thing, but basically just connecting with a pastor and his family and seeing what kind of resourcing and encouragement they need. So anyway, something pretty new for our district. Super excited to see this unfolding and really privileged to be a part of it and also very thankful for a home church to stay plugged into because this is what happens a lot of times in ministry too that we feel like we have to give 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 which is is great we we love to give but if we're not receiving or being poured into and receiving encouragement and receiving what we need not only from the lord but from others then our our reserve tanks can run empty and then that's a really dangerous place to be in and we don't want pastors and missionaries to ever run run on empty we want to be part of filling their tanks so that's what we're headed for awesome yeah yeah so again yeah um again a big thank you pastor and and we just love you guys and thank you so much for continuing to embrace us and affirming our calling and missions and 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 knowing that's been such a part of, of who we are um, it makes a transition feel easier when you come out of a wilderness experience um, because you know but this is this is not what our season here at solid rock has been it's not been a wilderness experience it's been amazing so it makes a transition maybe all that much more harder to do but we're also excited for what god has so we're stepping into new provision you're stepping into new provision don't forget that god has it's not necessary don't 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 think of transition as being always the next thing being better it could be harder uh, it, it, but it, it's always, there's always good provision along the way. We don't grow without, we don't grow without it. Yeah, yeah, I know. So she, that's not predict, I'm not, you know, prophesying here or anything like that. <laughs> My point is God does stretch us at times and grows us and uh, challenges us in new areas. So we're, we're excited about that part. So thank you, pastor. Love you, buddy. Amen. I'm excited that God's expanding the borders of our ministry. Amen. Uh, Pastor Tim is being promoted. After three years of counseling me, he received a PhD. <laughs> He's past having doubts that he could help anybody. And uh, so uh, working with me for like this for the past three and a half years and that, and just amazing, such a blessing. But the greatest thing about this is they get to expand and go out. They're still a part of our family. We're still having their influence and their help and their support. So, so thankful for that. Amen? So we love that. But it just allows us to expand out. And when you think about it with Sean and Dana being in Loomis, them now traveling out. So God is really giving our church an amazing outreach and expansion for what he's doing here. And we get to be a part of that. Then also, uh, we're now, as we've uh, let you know, we're also giving covering to... uh, 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 Pastor Khadija and uh, Yeshua Askari and uh, a Persian church. So we have a Persian congregation as well in, in uh, Folsom that we uh, give oversight to and help with and support to. So what a cool time, eh, Ben? And so through that, God is doing great things. So we're excited for everything going on and all that God is doing. And uh, we're so blessed that each and every one of you are part of it. And Pastor Tim, thank you so much. You've just been a blessing and uh, help in so many areas. And and uh, so many of you, he's helped in this area. But there's, So we just wanted you to see it as that way. We're excited because they're still here, but God's launching them. So we get the best of both worlds. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I said, he goes, well, we're transitioning. I think, well, oh, no, you can't go away. And he goes, well, no, we're not going away. And I said, okay, cool. I like that. Amen. So uh, good stuff. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, this morning, I just want to take a couple minutes and, uh, and just to encourage you, especially in this season and uh, with everything going on. What a crazy day we live in. Amen. And, uh, and everything that's happening around us. And it seems like it's getting crazier by the moment. And so I've been sharing. I shared last week in dealing with the battle, winning the battle against unbelief. I'm just going to tag team a little bit on that. We'll pick up most of this again next week. But I just want to take a few moments this morning and encourage each and every one of us in our faith. In fact, if you have your Bibles, go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 
And uh, I just want to share this thought with you. Um, and as I was just doing my devotions this week and uh, meditating on what direction to take and, and uh, continuing this message and that, I came to uh, reading in Philippians. And as I'm reading in Philippians and I'm reading a reminder that this is a book that Paul wrote while in prison. And then I begin to think about that, and uh, Paul actually wrote four of his epistles from prison in Rome. And uh, so I started thinking about that and the ministry that comes with that and, and tying into winning the battle against unbelief. And so you see on the cover of your outline, it says, Paul's prison letters, lessons of faith and adversity. I thought, man, what a great way to tie into this. And so faith, and that's something for us to understand, faith is for adversity. Amen? And uh, I know we didn't say our thing, but did you bring your Bibles this morning? Yes. Amen. Say this with me. This is my Bible. I live by its truth. I walk in its light. I rest in its promises. I, powered by its love. I overcome by the faith received produced from receiving this seed sown into my heart. Father, I thank you this morning for your love and your grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the life-giving, transforming power of your word in our lives. And we thank you, Father, today we will be enriched and strengthened in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. And so Paul uh, is... Uh, uh, also had the care of the churches, not only his own life, his own walk, but the care of the churches. And in dealing with that, we often think about how faith works in our lives. And so I, I want you to hear this. Paul was always concerned about people's faith. And as your pastor, that's always been my concern. And especially as I listen to people in the conversations that come up today. Uh, and we talked about it yesterday at, at, at uh, the men's breakfast and that. Uh, and to understand fear and faith operate exactly the same. They're, 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 the, the way they operate is exactly the same. Fear is based on something that you believe. Faith is based upon what you believe. They both speak what they believe. Fear and faith both have a voice. And when you're in fear, you're declaring what you're afraid of. People say, I'm afraid of the dark. I'm afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of mayonnaise, whatever. You know, people have all kinds of fears about everything, and we confess our fears all the time. Then the Bible comes along and tells us to confess our faith, to hold fast to the profession of our faith, to continually be declaring what we believe. It, it, I mean, I understand, and even as I said last week, there was a gentleman who, who brought his son to the Lord, and the Lord said, hey, do you believe that I can do this? I said, Lord, I believe to help my unbelief. Too many times we're asking God to help us in our unbelief instead of help us kill our unbelief. I don't, know about you, I don't want to help my unbelief. I want to crucify my unbelief. I want to put it to death. I want to move past it. Are you doing all right? Amen. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, I want to read the first five verses to you. It says, Therefore, when the suspense of separation or yearning for some personal communication from you became intolerable, I'm reading from the Amplified, we consented to being left behind alone at Athens, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's servant, in spreading the good news the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and establish and to exhort and to comfort and encourage you in your faith. That's always been my, my, my goal as your pastor. You find out I get kind of intense. On, I want you to be people of faith. I want you to have faith in God. I want you to believe God. Above everything else, believe God. I mean, well, I, I, yes, there, there's truths, there's realities, there's things we have to deal with and things we have to have trust and confidence in. But above all, believe God in every season, in every situation. That's where Paul was. Verse 3, that no one of you should be disturbed, beguiled, and led astray by these afflictions and difficulties to which I have referred. For you yourselves know that this is unavoidable, unavoidable in our position and must be recognized as our appointed law. Or Paul said problems, controversies, afflictions, trials, tribulations, that, that's part of serving God. Amen. And answering the call of God upon your life. Jesus said it like this in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John. He says, in the world you will have tribulation. 
In the world you have problems. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So our life is hidden in Christ, in God, and we are in the overcomer. Amen? And so that's where we live. Verse 4, even when we were with you, you know we warned you plainly beforehand that we were to be pressed with difficulties, made to suffer affliction, just as our own knowledge, just just as to your knowledge, it has since happened. Verse 5. That is the reason that when I could bear the suspense no longer, I sent that I might learn how you were standing the strain and the endurance of your faith. For I was fearful, listen to this, lest somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our toil among you should prove to be fruitless and to no purpose. Or in other words, that when you hear of afflictions, you hear of trials, you hear of tribulation, you, you hear of me as Paul, or we hear of other Christians going through things. Well, I thought they believed God. I thought, I guess faith doesn't work. What is God doing? And you give up on your faith. It, it does shipwreck to your faith. So Paul says, I'm just overly concerned. I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to find out, how is your faith? Are you still standing strong? In spite of everything you hear, do you still have faith in God? Amen. And that's so important that we understand that. Look at the cover of your outline. You see Paul's four letters there from prison were Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians are some of the deepest revelations of who Jesus Christ is and what it means to live our lives in him and through him. Amen. Just amazing letters to churches. These are four letters written by Paul during the last two years of his life, and he's under house arrest. And while he's under house arrest, he's actually having to provide for his own life, his life. He has to care for himself. He doesn't eat. He's not in a paid prison where they're providing you with a bed and, 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 uh, you know, blankets and clothing and food and everything else. Yeah, he's there. If he has any sustenance to his life at all, it's by what people are bringing to him. He has to provide for his own livelihood while being on house arrest and under Roman guard in that. So think about that. So he's there at his own expense in Rome awaiting his own execution. And while he's there in prison providing for himself, he's receiving guests. People are coming to him and saying, hey, Paul, could you minister to me? Hello? Could you minister to me? People in his, not people necessarily coming and, and supporting him, but people also coming and placing a demand on him to still keep pouring out his life to them. Isn't it interesting that he wrote to Timothy, he says, I've already lived and my life is being poured out as a drink offering to the Lord. Man, what if we grew up enough to live like that for the Lord? To allow our lives to be poured out for him. And so in Rome, he's receiving gas, he's ministering to others, and still caring for the churches until the day he was beheaded for the gospel of Christ. So he's there. The end of that two years, the, 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 the Caesar had his head cut off. I bet. For being preaching the gospel and appealing to Caesar. Think about it. See, we would all enjoy living in a positive, no stress environment. Get anybody want to sign up for that? I'm ready for a positive, no stress environment. Wouldn't that be awesome? Praise the Lord. Amen. That'd be great. But our faith in God is not given to us to produce a utopian life here on earth. Rather, our faith equips us for adversity. To be able to have peace in the midst of the storms of life and to be at rest in unrestful situations. To still function and even flourish in adversity. I want to tell you, every right now, every Christian, everybody watching on, on the internet, however you're viewing this, all of you here, let me just say this to you. You should be at rest in this season. If I'm not at rest in this season, then somehow the tempter has tempted me. And he's moved me off of my peace. Jesus said like this, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but I'm giving you a peace that, that abides on the inside of you. Amen? Peace is actually part of the fruit of the Spirit operating in our life along with joy. So we have this indwelling presence and peace of God in our life. Think about this. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from hearing the Word of God. So every time I hear the Word, something happens and it speaks to my spirit and faith comes alive. Meaning, faith meaning I just believe God. 
I believe it's going to work out. I believe this. I believe that everything about our life, God already knows what's happening. Do you know that he tells us the end from the beginning? He goes to the end and then tell, takes us back to the beginning. He reveals the end and then takes us back to the beginning. That's what we, we read it over a little auto this morning that God already pre planned your whole life and made the past that you should walk in. Do you know that He knows everything you're ever going to face? God knew you'd be alive during the Rona season. You're the believers, you're, you're the believers that He has here for the Corona invasion. And He was hoping there'd be a few of you that wouldn't freak out. And lose your minds. Amen. Let, let me just give you an update, everybody watching. You know what? I believe that, 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 that you know, you, you can get sick. It, it, it's a virus. It's been introduced into, human, in, into humanity globally. This is a global virus that's been introduced in, into human society. It is not going away. It has now been introduced. It's going to be passed on. So you're going to have to learn how to live with it. It's here to stay. You have to learn how to deal with it. And as we build up more immunity and thing, then, then it gets weaker and weaker. Yeah. And how to tax that. So we have to learn how to deal with that. But let me just give you an update. When they're telling you to wear a mask, there's some instructions that comes with wearing a mask. The first instruction is, is that if you can't social distance, if you can't stay a, a safe distance apart from spit, <laughs> then put a mask on. Which right there tells you, you don't need it walking through the parking lot by yourself. I'm seriously going on a man card rejection fight. Every man that I see walking through a parking lot by himself with a mask on in open air, I just want to slap and take away your man card. Especially if you're a Christian. Anyway, moving right along. So faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. And so believing God, God in this. I believe you give me an immune system. I believe that my faith is greater than this. I believe that no deadly thing will harm me. Bless God. I believe that I live in the point zero zero one percent Amen. I'm going to survive. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That's why I said years ago, people say, what well, was the coronavirus? I said, the, what's that? I've had bubonic plague. I have had bubonic. I'm not making a joke. I have had bubonic plague. Wow. Amen. I survived the black death. That's what Sue said when they said I had it. They go, she goes, isn't that the black death? <laughs> Amen. I used to be normal before that. <laughs> Hallelujah. So watch this. So faith comes by hearing the word. But Matthew 7 says this. The word heard and acted upon in our life provides a foundation of faith that cannot be shaken by the storms of life. When I hear the word and act on the word, I have a foundation that cannot be shaken. Listen to me. By the storms of life. Jesus said storms come against your life. He didn't say it would be a life of peace. He didn't say if you had faith, you would never have storm. You would never have adversity. He said if you heard the word and acted on the word, then you would have a foundation that would not be moved by the storms of life. So he said, you're going to endure storm. You're going to have storms. You're going to have winds. You're going to have floods. They're going to beat against your house. They're going to come against you. But faith in God causes you to be strong. When we named our church Solid Rock Faith Center, why do we have that name? Because that's what we want to do. We want your life to be built on the Word of God. I want you having a solid rock foundation in your life. Amen? That's what we're after. See, faith considers the storms of life as light affliction that lasts but for a moment. And it keeps our eyes focused on the things that are eternal. Faith keeps your eyes focused on what's everything else is temporal. Everything happening is temporal. The, the word temporal means this, subject to change. Everything is subject to change. Are you doing all right? 
Look inside your outline. Faith refuses to be moved by the circumstances it sees. Instead, walks by the power of what it knows. Faith walks by the power of what it knows. Amen. I love reading Oswald Chambers and stuff. And, and, and he said, that, I, I put it up this morning. I couldn't pass it up. He says, don't think you're, you're, you're too profound. Don't go around thinking you're so profound in your depth and your theology. He said, God became a baby. Amen. So he's talking about thinking small and being simple, but always try to be so deep and you just make yourself look foolish. Amen. So watch it. But faith, walking by, but, but, but when you know God, you move into a realm of simplicity and relationship. And so you walk by who you know. Not what you see. The one I know gives me assurance against what I'm seeing. Are you doing all right? Amen. And then Ephesians 6 tells us that faith is our shield of defense while we wield the sword of the Spirit. Now think about that. Taking the shield of faith which is able to do what? Quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. What does that mean? Everybody look up here. It means you're under attack. It means that there are darts coming against you. And so I have to be in in the battle. Winning the battle against unbelief means that I have to be engaged. I can't be passive. I can't just sit down. I have to be engaged. And I have to hold up the shield of faith. And while I'm holding the shield of faith, that means I can grab the sword of the Spirit and cut the devil's head off. Amen. I I can defeat the adversary. So, So I have a weapon of defense so I can yield my weapon of offense. The sword of the Spirit. A sword is an offensive weapon. It's moving forward. Do you know the armor of God has nothing to cover your butt? So when Christians turn to run, you're getting shot. People go, man. I think a lot of lower back pain is getting shot in the butt by the devil. Turn around and move forward. Amen? That's my theology. You deal with it every way you want. Amen? So watch this. Second, First and Timothy and Second Timothy declares us that faith is for fighting a good fight. Paul told Timothy, said, 1 Timothy 6, 12, he said, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Amen. You know what a good fight is? The one you win. Amen. I've been in some fights that weren't so good. I like being in the ones that you win. A good fight is the fight that you win. Hallelujah. Every time Jesus spoke to his disciples about faith, it was connected to an adverse situation to reveal and to reveal the source of their victory. Faith is for adversity. Let me go back to that. And and I told them in yesterday morning, too many Christians have the idea, man, if I just had enough faith, I wouldn't have problems. I'm, I'm serious. People think that. And so we read from the life, I don't have time to read it this morning, but we read from the life of Paul. Go read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. When Paul is dealing with, uh, to, to the church at Corinth, about the validity of his apostleship. Of being an apostle and, and having authority to speak and talk to them. He talked about what he endured. Let me just give you this. This is what he said. Five times I was beaten With 39 lashes. That's almost 200 lashes across his back. Five times I was beaten, whipped, with 39 lashes. Then three more times I was beaten with rods. How many want to sign up for that ministry? He says, I was stoned and left for dead. That was a rough church. That was a tough Sunday morning service. (laughs) Man, I felt like I was in that service one time myself. Amen. I got out the back door quick. Amen. But in that, listen, I was stoned and left for dead. Do you know what they, they, they left him for dead? Do you know what he did? He got back up and went back into the city after they stoned him. And so we read about all that about Paul, and then we talked about what we have to complain about. What are you enduring? He says, I was shipwrecked three times. 
I, I was a day and a night floating on a board in the ocean. And then, all of this. But no, watch, watch, watch. You know what Paul says? You know what he calls that? He says, but these are my light afflictions. These are my light afflictions. What do you call your light affliction? I have a cold, man. I'm really down. You pray for me. I don't know if I'll make it this week. We need to start taking away some man cards. I'm just saying. Amen? You say, Pastor, why you like that? Be- because, re- li- listen, guys, listen, guys. The Bible says in the last days, perilous times will come. And with perilous times comes false deceptions that even the very elect are deceived. The reason I'm preaching like this, because if we're getting closer to the end time and the culmination of all things, you're going to have to have very sure faith in God. American faith isn't going to work anymore. American Christianity isn't going to work anymore. You're going to have to have real faith in God. Do you know right now there are churches all over. There are churches who, who don't want to have church, don't want to come in person because right now they're being told by the government they can't. Do you know in Iran right now, in Iraq, there are churches that are having, there, there are people that are having churches right now because the government tells them they can't? They're meeting right now knowing not, not, not will they just get, uh, uh, have their doors closed and maybe be fined a few bucks, but they'll be killed. There are people who are actually moving against government regulations right now and having faith in God and coming together and worshiping God because their faith in God is stronger than their fear of man. And in dealing with that, they're saying, I'd rather put my life on the line to serve God than bow in fear before man. And I'm not saying about being that radical, but America has never been pressured. America has never had to pay a price. We come and go. We, We have consumer Christianity. We go to the churches that make us feel good, that make us do this, that tell us how great life is, and everything else. How many know uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 would never make it in the book, Your Best Life Now? <laughs> Paul said, this is my best life. He, he counted it a joy to be serving the Lord, to endure everything that he was doing for the gospel's sake. What we have missed is we've made a lot of things that are choices and personal consequences of reaping what we've sown and called that being persecuted. And we're giving up to things that we should have victory over. Think about that. So Jesus, speaking to his disciples, declared to them that faith was for adversity. Faith was for calming storms, for casting out devils, for feeding multitudes, for answering the challenge of being a disciple. Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica, as we read, was connected to his concern for their faith after they heard of his affliction. Paul's instruction to Timothy was connected to stirring up the gifts of God and walking and warring by faith in both of his letters to that young man. Think about the faith life or the life of faith. It is lived from the inside out, not from the outside in. The world and the natural course of life around us wants to live and be influenced from the outside in. To believe that what we add outwardly to our lives is greater than what we possess inwardly. That's the world that you live in. Add this to your, if you had this, your life would be so much better. Think about every commercial. Every commercial for every product promises to make your life better because you added something outwardly to your life. God says, I'll make your life better. I'll put my life on the inside of you. And it won't matter what's happening around you because the greater one will be in you and you'll live your life through me regardless of what's going on around you. Amen. Amen. So think about that. Jesus proclaimed a life lived from the inside out. To be born again with new life in your spirit and heart. To live life from there, out of your spirit, living your life. Paul declared that we would become a new creation with new life in our inner man. Listen, and and we refer to it, but I want you to hear it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Everybody look up here. Do not lose heart. In everything going on, no matter what you hear, don't lose heart. Amen. Think about it. Even though what? Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Here it is. For our light affliction, being beaten 200 times, being whipped with rods, piece of cake. That's what Paul said. It's just like he goes, that's all you got? Do you know John on the Isle of Patma? Do you know they boiled the dude in oil? 
They like sent him to Kentucky Fried Chicken, stuck him in and brought him. And they go, we can't even cook him. He survived. He survived being dipped in oil. And so they sent him to Patmos to crush rocks. To a gra- He's crushing gravel for Roman roads. And listen to this. This is what he says. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day in the gravel yard. Lifting my arms, scarred by oil, praising God. And I heard a voice behind me saying, what did you say, Pastor, what are you trying? I'm just trying to say it's time for real Christianity, guys. It's time for real believers to rise up, to get over whatever's happening in your life. God, whatever the situation is, this is what Paul, see, see in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul delineates everything he endured. And then he starts chapter 12, says that, that I've received, I knew a man caught up into the third heavens, whether in the body or out of the body. I don't know, but he's seen vision. He's seen revelation. And he says, because of the abundance of revelation that is given to me, God poured who he is into my heart and he wants me to give it out. He says, you can say this, you can't say this. Look at this, isn't that cool? You don't get to talk about that, but you can say this, this, and this. But for all of that revelation, there was a messenger of Satan given to me, lest I be exalted above measure. Lest I get prideful in dealing with that. And so I'm praying, Lord, could, could I just be removed from this tribulation that every time I pray, every time I declare your word, can I be removed from that tribulation? And the Lord said, no, this is what I will do. I'll give you grace to endure it. I'll give you grace to endure it. Every tribulation, every trial, every test, everything you come up against, this is what God said to you. I, I, I don't take it from you. I give you grace to get through it and come out victorious on the other side. So when you're going through something where you feel you're weak, you don't have any strength, you do what Paul said. You said, I will glory in my weaknesses. God, I'm at a weak moment. I have no strength for this. I can't produce this of myself. The Lord said, I'm not asking you to do This is what I do. The power of Christ, Paul said, rests upon me. You're a candidate for Christ's power to come upon your life. And then you rise up in the strength. We read it last week. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his. That's what grace is in your life. It's the might and the power of God resting upon you. And we go, hey, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to make it? You just go, I'm grace to win. Amen, Pastor. That is awesome. Woo! I'll just be excited for you. Hallelujah. Amen. So watch this. So Paul says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Keep your eyes on the right thing. Amen. And I shared it with the men yesterday morning. And I have to close this morning. But I shared it with the men yesterday morning. Paul was reaping the harvest of what he sowed. Before Paul became a Christian, he persecuted the church. He had people beaten. He had them in prison. He even had them put to death. And he gave permission for the stoning of Stephen. And when you read what he endured, he's the same person that penned Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So Paul says, I understand I'm reaping what I sowed. But the only way to get through the harvest of what I sowed is by the grace of God. This is what God says. I can't alter my word. God set a law. Man lives by the seed, time, and harvest. You live by what you sow. Most of what we endure in life is made and comes about because of stupid choices. And then we want God to give us a miracle to get us out of our choice. Every now and then God will give you a miracle and get you over. 
Eli and I were laughing because we were setting up for the ladies in here, and uh, we, we got the video set up so they could watch a movie and, and all that stuff. And I said, Eli, r- r- go get a DVD, and we'll put it in. So he brought it. He found a DVD from 2005. And this young guy that looked a lot like me with a lot more hair was preaching. <laughs> and the kid could preach. He is preaching on the difference between a miracle and a harvest. Most Christians are living their life looking, wanting God to do miracles in their life. Miracles are for wilderness. They're they're in a place where there's no prison, no provision, and no opportunity to sow. So in that place of no provision and no opportunity to sow, you live by the miracle provision of God. But miracles aren't a lifestyle. Seed time and harvest is your lifestyle. Pastor Tim said it this morning when he brought them over, when they crossed over, the miracle provision in because they were no longer in 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 the wilderness. Now they're living in the promise. And the promised land is where you sow and you reap and you sow and you reap. Amen. Because the problem is, if you need a miracle and you don't change your behavior, you'll need another one tomorrow and another one day after tomorrow because you haven't changed your behavior. And God was never meant to be a miracle provider for stupid choices. Are you doing all right? Amen. So think about this. That's where we're supposed to live, that faith life. He declares there's a life within us that is eternal. While the outward life is temporal, subject to change and perishing, the things which are not seen are more real than the things which are seen. Faith lived out from this unseen place of the heart. We're called to live by faith from this unseen place of the heart. That's more important today than ever before. All the stuff going around you, you better learn how to live faith from the inside out. Believe God in all things. Could you shout amen this morning? 1 Peter chapter 3 says this, don't let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, I don't have to worry about that, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Think about that. Peter declares that a woman's true beauty is not in her outward adornment or apparel, but in the beauty of of her inner life in Christ. You see, this is so contrary to our day in the world we live in, where we search for outward validation in place of inward confirmation of the Spirit. Think about that. This inward man of the heart cannot be seen with the physical eyes nor touched with our physical hand. This life is not physical but spiritual. Faith is not physical but spiritual, and it resides in the inner man of your heart. If the worship team will come back quickly and help me. We must renew our minds to this. The world wants us to conform to the, to the way it lives. Hear me. The world wants you to conform to the way it lives. Yeah. Have church like this. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. The world lives in fear. God's people cannot live in fear. You have to understand that. You, you cannot allow fear to come in. You, you, whatever it takes it, without being... I, I, I get funny and I get sarcastic and doing all that, but I'm serious about not giving no place to fear. Fear comes from the devil. Listen to what the the, Paul just comes and said, give no place to the devil. Fear does not come from God. Listen to what it says. God has not given you the spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit that tries to work in your life. And a spirit that is not from God, every spirit that is not from God is a controlling spirit. And fear will control your life unless you fight against it. That's why this is called the battle against unbelief. Think about it. We have to renew our minds to this. The world wants you to conform to the way it lives. God wants to set us free from the course of this world. He gives us the life and the faith in our hearts to do just that. So what do we do? Choose to live your life from the inside out by faith. Feed the hidden man of your heart with the word of faith, the bread of life. What did Jesus say? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You live by this word. Jesus declared life would flow out of you like a river of living water. That's the life of the Spirit. So what do we do, guys? Choose to live this life by faith. Never forget that you are made for adversity and you are equipped to win. Amen. Yeah, look at you get up every day. Man, I'm made for this fight. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. And besides that, I'm equipped to win. God, God puts us in the battle, and he gives you everything you need to win. 
He gives you all the armor. Think about that. Listen to what Paul said even when we read it in 2 Corinthians 10. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. He equips us with mighty weapons even to control our thought life. Amen. People go, well, Lord, take this from me. Lord, I just can't help thinking like this. Lord, I keep having these thoughts. Lord, could you take these thoughts? He said, Donna, take them. I told you how to get rid of them. Amen. How can I say this? Nice. Paul said it like this. Paul said, I could not speak to you as mature, but only as babes. Because where there's war, straps, and division among you, you're carnal and, and you're, it's immature. There's a place where we grow up. Hebrews 5 says that, that we grow that place where we're able to discern, ha- having our senses exercised to discern between good and evil, and then growing to a place where we can actually teep and help others to grow up. The, the goal of every believer is that everybody can grow up to a place of maturity where you have something settled in your life. In fact, those things, he ends chapter 5 telling us that we're supposed to be grown up and mature and able to take the meat of the word and not just need, come on, I was teasing the guys the other day about being nipple babies. Come on, we're supposed to get you off the bottle. Too many Christians are still nipple babies. They're they're, they're still on the bottle of milk. And if it gets too strong, (coughs) give me another bottle. Hello? Hello? But, but Paul said, you're, you're supposed to be beyond needing milk and able to digest the meat of the word. And then once you digest it, you can now feed and strengthen others and build up others. And then he goes on in chapter 6 and he tells you down that we're leaving the principles of these things. Of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, laying on of hand, doctrine of baptism, and all these things. That, that we move on from that into maturity. See, there's a place where you settle some things in your life. I don't have to go back and revisit that. That's settled. It's done. It's finished in Christ. Now I live for God's glory to be manifest through my life. And God has you in this season. You are the believers that he has in this season of a worldwide epidemic, of an attack against the church globally. And he's believing that you're the people that he's appointed to this hour to declare the glory of God and establish his kingdom. God is looking for his church to rise up. Never again agree with the defeated enemy and give up ground that belongs to you. You're being led by a victorious Savior. 2 Corinthians said, Christ always leads us in triumph. Amen? Stand with me this morning. Never forget that our faith in God equips us for adversity. You know, I hear people tell it all the time, well, Pastor, you just don't know what we're going through. Well, just stop and listen to what you just said. You're going through it, so just start rejoicing in that. Hallelujah. You're not camping there. You don't have to live there the rest of your life. This is just something I'm going through. How's it going? Well, it's not the best, but I've been through worse. Glory to God. I'll come out on the other side. Amen. I've been through a lot. I'm still here. Do I have any friends in the house? See, it's all, it's all just a paradigm shift. It's all just a perspective change. God, you brought me through. I've de- Listen to what David said when Goliath came. He said, man, I've already killed a bear. I've already killed a lion. This dude is chump change. He had no problem. You go back and think about what God's done for you. You were made and given faith for adversity. He's already declared you're more than a conqueror. When something rises up, you just live by this too shall pass. Amen. Think about it. Our faith equips us for adversity so that we are able to have peace in the midst of the storms of life. It causes us to be at rest even in unrestful situations. And as His children, we can still function and even flourish in times of adversity. Father, I thank You today. You're an amazing God. Come on, just raise a hand up to heaven. Come on, if you've been under stress, if you've been under pressure, if this whole season has put a weight on you. See, fear comes, and fear does the same thing. Fear brings weight and pressure upon your life. Fear brings weight and pressure bearing down upon your life. But God brings His glory into your life.
The definition of glory and the glory of God is the weight of God, the presence of God. When it stands, it said that the glory of God filled the temple so that the priest couldn't stand to minister. It meant that the presence of God was so heavy, so thick upon them that they couldn't get up to even praise him and to magnify him. I would I, I want the weight of God. I don't want the weight of fear upon my life. I want the weight of his glory. The weight of assurance that I believe God. I'm standing in him. That's why Paul says, having done all to stand, just keep standing and let the weight of his presence settle down upon you. And when his presence is there, you can't move. You just have to stand still and see the salvation of God. Father, I thank you today for your word in our lives. I thank you over your people, Father. I pray a release of your glory upon their lives. Father, that's your glory. Your presence would flood into every home, flood into every life. Father, they would feel you setting down upon them. Father, I come against fear, every lie of the devil, every attack of the enemy in this moment, in this time. God, you've called these people. You've called us to be your people in this moment, in this hour. So, Father, we choose. We will be a people of faith. We will walk by faith. We will speak by faith. We will act by faith. We will live by faith from the inward man out. Thank you, Lord, for your life in us. We declare your praise in this place. We declare your praise in this place. See, there are some of you, even when you come into church, you're, you're hoping for a good song. You hope for something to light you up. Come on, you're supposed to bring His presence with you. You're supposed to be able to press out and bust out into praise and to God. Refuse. Let me just say this to you. Everybody look up here just for a moment. You need to remember this. Praise always gains an audience with God. Praise always gains an audience with God. And when you're in a hard situation, say, God, I don't understand it. I don't have an answer. I'm just going to get out of my mind. I'm going to get out of my mind. And I'm going to praise you anyway. Father, I thank you. You're glorious. I magnify you. People look at you. What are you doing? You're in a mess. No, I'm in the right attitude. I'm positioning myself. I'm outside of myself because I know that God is my answer. He's already gone before me and made a way. He knew I'd be going through this. He knew this was going to happen. He's already prearranged my steps and my path. My victory is already set. I'm on a set course with God. I'm going to praise Him for it. Hallelujah. Lord of God. Amen. Come on, begin to pray. Come on, guys, lead us. Whatever you got, lead us and let's sing. Come on, let's just close. Let's just sing. Worship God. Come on, out of your heart. truth older than the ages. There is a